Welcome, guys. Uh, I'm Tom Douthit, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, my inclusion here today is, uh, I know Travis Austin, and he invited me to, to come here today after we were part of a group together, and we shared some different things. But as a dad, I'm here because I'm a father of four. Uh, my kids are now age 34, 33, 31, 29, which means I had four kids in five years. Okay, and which tells you that planning is my strong suit and uh, not. And uh, and if there is one season of my life that I wish I could go back and do again, it would be when my kids were five, four, two and zero. And it was that the reason I'd like to go back is not because it was so much fun but because I was such a jerk. <laughs> my expectations uh, of my wife during that season were absolutely ridiculous. So we have four little kids, ages five and under. I was actually pastoring a church at that point in time, and I had expectations of my wife about her engagement in our church. I had expectations of wife about the condition of our home. I had expectations that we would have a rockin' sex life. I had expectations of what our kids would be like. And I look back now and I go, you are so dumb. Really dumb. I mean, it was really, really bad. So... Uh, so that's kind of my, my, my uh, fathering claim to unfame. Um, uh, I have four kids are grown. Three of them are married. The fourth one is engaged. All here in Houston, we have five grandkids now. And uh, it's a sweet season. But what's already been said, and I think probably almost every room, it's a lot of work. It's hard being a dad. All right. So my topic in this time is what I'm calling a, a long game strategy for dads. Okay, there's this thing, it's probably mentioned in some of the other groups, I'm guessing, I don't know if it has or not, but there's this dynamic that's called the father effect. And the father effect is something like this, as goes the father, so goes the family. There's all kinds of statistics. Here's just a kind of a list of different things. Okay, when there are present and engaged fathers in the home, the kids are less likely to drop out of school, less likely at the end of a jail, less likely to engage in risky behavior, uh, less likely to have sex at a un- young age. They're more likely to land in a high paying job, to have a healthy, stable relationships, and to have a higher IQ beginning even at age three. So, okay, so here's the deal. As goes the father, so goes the family. If we were like sitting around a, a fire pit and we're talking and we're just going around the room, I guarantee you that story would show up. As goes the father, so goes the family. So my desire in this time is, is, to, is to push it upstream. I mean, if it's true that as goes the father, so goes the family, and fathering is really hard, and it, but, but how I do as a dad is going to affect how my family is, what I want to do is push it further upstream to say, how do we be healthy dads for the long haul? I, I, heard, I heard something uh, this week. 30% of people in the Bible... Only 30% of people in the Bible finish strong. I mean, 70% kind of go off the rails sometime before they finish the race, whatever it is. Okay, so here's the dynamic I want to talk about today. As goes your heart, as goes the heart, so goes the man. As goes the father, so goes the family. So what do we have to do to push upstream to this idea of what's going on in my heart that shapes who I am as a man, that shapes who I am as a father, that shapes the condition of my family, okay? That's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna look at one verse from, from the Bible and then in like four different sort of ways to flesh it out in our world. Here's, here's, the, here's the verse. 
Proverbs 4.23, I'll give it to you in three different translations because they, they each sort of highlight a different little nuance, all right? Uh, Proverbs 4.23 in the New American Standard Translation of the Bible says this, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. Watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life, okay? The New International Version puts it like this. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The New Living Translation kind of ratchets it up one a little bit more and it says this. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. As goes the heart, so goes the man. So if I'm sitting in your spot, my first question is, what are we talking about when we're talking about the heart? Okay, what is it or what isn't the heart when he's talking about here? All right, so the first thing, what the heart isn't. The heart isn't your emotions. All right, so when it tells you to guard your heart, this is not some call to be emotionally invulnerable and protective. For most of us as men, that's the default setting. Anyhow, we don't need any direction to be that, right? When he's talking about heart, he's not talking about your emotions. What he's talking about, when he talks about the the heart, he's talking about the inner man, the true you, the guy who's down inside. So another verse over in the, in the Proverbs 23, seven, it says, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Now, like some TV preachers will take that verse and say, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. So think about what you want to become and you'll become that. You can actualize your dreams by thinking on it. And I heard another person once say, if a man becomes what he thinks about the most, then most of the men I know would actually be women. Okay, so, so that's, not, that's not what it means, all right? It's, the rest of that verse says something like this. If a dude is laughing with you, but inside he hates you, as he thinks within himself, so he is. It's what's going on inside is the real deal. That's the heart. You know, that's why Jesus, you know, he he, kind of railed on the religious leaders at the time, you know. He said, you honor God with your lips, but your hearts are far from him. He says, you're like a whitewashed tomb. You're pretty on the outside, but you're a mess on the inside. And he wasn't saying this to beat him down. He was doing this to wake him up. See, what he said of like famous King David from the Old Testament of the Bible was uh, uh, God does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. It's the true you, All right? So it's what's going on inside. And what we're told here is that we got to guard our hearts. So what kind of things do we guard? We guard things that are valuable and powerful, Generally. Every Sunday night, I take my trash can, I roll it out to the curb, and I set it out there, and I go back in the house, and eventually go to bed. I have never yet once woken up in the middle of the night worried about the trash. Like, oh, no one messes with the trash, because it's worthless. I don't have to worry about it. But if I was laying in that bed, and all of a sudden, I remembered, oh, my gosh, I left my backpack in the car, and my computers in my backpack, I'd be out of bed. I would go get it. I would retrieve it, because there's something valuable there. So what he's telling us and telling us to guard our hearts, he's telling us, this is something of real value. And it's qualified in two different ways. He says, you've got to guard this. One translation says, with all diligence. And the other says, above all else. So the insight that we give on how to live wisely is this. Taking care of what's going on inside should be first priority and with great intensity. That's right, so what he's saying. Why? Okay, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flows the springs of life. So the picture he's given is is what's going on inside of us is like the headwaters of a river. And what's coming out of that spring is eventually going to influence everything downstream. So I've got this place that I want to go, my bucket list, is a place called Itasca State Park. It's in Minnesota. It's the headwaters of the Mississippi. And the reason I want to go there is because you can jump across the Mississippi at that one place. And I better do it pretty soon or I'm not going to be able to make the four or five foot leap. But you can jump across the Mississippi in Itasca State Park. But imagine that we came up to to Itasca State Park with a tanker truck full of arsenic. I started 
pumping arsenic down into the headwaters of the Mississippi. What's going to happen in Des Moines and St. Louis and Memphis and Baton Rouge? Well, immediately nothing. But ultimately, everything downstream is going to be affected by what's coming out of the spring. That's the picture that he's given us here. That's how important what's going on on the inner man of our, our life is that the way the other translation puts it, everything you do flows from it or it determines the course of your life. Okay, so I'll tell you why this is a... a a topic of passion to me. Uh, it could be, I've, I've violated this plenty, plenty of times, but I had this, years ago, I had this guy come in my office when I was leading church. And he was a young guy, but he was like, man, this guy's going to be our, he's our next wave leader. You know, he'd been through some stuff. He'd done well, he had good skills, whatever. And he walks into my office that day. I knew him. I thought I knew him. He walks into my office that day and he said, I just want you to know, uh, I'm leaving my wife and kids. I don't love her anymore. In fact, I don't think I ever did. So he's un emotionally unhitching from every responsibility he had as a husband and a father. And he leaves. Okay, you would never have guessed this by looking. I'm telling you, we, look, we live in a world where everybody freaking looks like they got it together. And I'm telling you, they don't. And if we don't pay attention to what's going on inside, it's just like arsenic coming out of the springs. It will poison things. So that guy I just told you about. So he was sort of a uh, perfectionist kind of personality and kind of a steadiness personality guy. His wife was pretty strong. So what was going on in his life, he was meeting with frustrations and anger and disappointment. But, he, but you would have never known it by looking at him. And what he was doing is he was storing it up and he was storing it up and he was storing it up and he was storing it up. Now I began to use this kind of cynical statement uh, where I say, uh, I don't think there's any such thing as a laid back person. There's just anger on the installment plan. And that's what was going on there. He stored it up, he stored it up, he stored it up and boom, right? And he blew a family apart because he didn't pay attention to what's going on inside. So, what, what I'm going to talk about in the moments we have left is, is four different sort of strategies for paying attention to what's going on inside. So you could be the best version of you, that you can be healthy. Now, it sounds like, well, this is a little selfish. Above all else, take care of me, right? But think about being on an airplane for just a moment. You know, the lady gets up at the beginning and she gives her inspiring speech about where the, where the exits are and what they'll be serving in the flight, et cetera. And then she says, in the event of the loss of cabin pressure, a mask will drop down in front of you. Put it on and breathe normally. If you're traveling with a child, what do they think? Put your mask on first. It doesn't, you know, the message isn't, in a time of crisis, ditch the kids. Take care of yourself. That's not the message, right? The message is, take care of yourself so that you've got the capacity to take care of the ones who are under your charge. That's the message. So four, four strategies. First is what I call uh, setting your spiritual thermostat. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, set your spiritual thermostat. Um, every one of us has probably got a tripwire emotion. Okay, some people here, their tripwire emotion is probably anger. Uh, some people, their tripwire emotion is probably fear. Some of this tripwire is going to be control. Okay, uh, I will tell you, um, I don't like saying this, but it's true. My tripwire is fear, anxiety. And there's all kinds of different fear people, right? There's, you know, there's death and dying fear people. I'm going to get a disease. I'm going to get a germ and I'm going to, I'm going to die. Mm, that's not me. You know, there is financial Worriers, fear people like, oh no, I'm afraid my green line of, of financial security is going to run out before my life does. Mm, that's not my worry. You know, there's conspiracy theory worries. I really think LeBron James is controlling the whole world. Okay, that's not, that's not me. I don't worry about that kind of stuff. I'm a people worrier. I'm a rejection fear guy. All right? And that's my tripwire. 
So when I talk about setting it, so, you know, maybe you have something come to mind, what's your tripwire? Okay, when you talk about setting your spiritual thermostat, it's this. Okay, there's a thermostat that's watching this room right now. It is set for something. There's a tripwire setting. So whenever it reaches 72 degrees or whatever it is in this room, boom, instantly something's going to turn. AC's going to come on or the heat's going to come on or whatever, whichever direction. Why? So that the rising temperature influence in the room doesn't get the upper hand. So the room stays where it's supposed to. Okay, that's the, that's the thermostat dynamic. So the same thing when we're talking about maintaining the condition of our inner man. All right, so what does it look like when your tripwire emotion starts, it, it, it just gets its first indication. For me, the, the, the fears I've just told you about, it's generally a shot of adrenaline that goes up through my chest. I, I know it, I can feel it. it psst, it's like a mist and it spreads, all right? That's my tripwire. And what happens in that moment is this, God, so I'm sitting here talking to Hector. He just said something to me, and, and I kind of feel intimidated, or I feel like, like less than because I'm talking to him, or, or I, I'm jealous of him, or whatever, whatever's going on. So and psst, I get that little thing. So I'm sitting here talking to Hector, but even though I'm talking to Hector, I start talking this way as well. God, I can feel what's going on inside of me, right? And what I'm saying by what I'm fearing is that like Hector is somehow my source of life. The Hector's approval of me is somehow makes me who I am. And I know that's a, that's a lie. Lord, I know that if you don't move in the midst of this, this fear will get the upper hand. So would you move by your spirit in me right now? Would you push this down? Help me be present with Hector in this moment to talk and be with him, but not be dominated by this self-centeredness in the form of fear, right? That, that, that's, that's what I mean in doing that. And, and, so it, it might be any number of other things, but you know, tripwire emotions are a little bit like the claws of a bird of prey. You know, when it gets a grip in your gut, the, the longer it sits, the harder it is to extract. You know, you nurse that anger a little bit, you hang on to it, chew on it, just let it sit. It, it, it goes beyond your chest, it goes to everything. You start, but revenge fantasies, and I'm going to tell them, I'm going to show them, and, and it just starts spinning up. And what it is, it's just letting the, the inner condition kind of, pssst, you know, it's letting poison come out of the spring. So set your spiritual thermostat is my first thing. Second thing is, golly, uh, I think today, uh, Travis, this is so awesome what you guys are doing. I think this whole thing today is a, is a great uh, incubator for, for number two, and that is this. Every man has got to have at least one level four friend. You've got to have a level four friend. And I won't go through different levels of what I mean by that, except a level four friend, according to uh, a friend of mine named Sam Albury, is, a, is an author, he says, is someone who knows your soul. Right? The Hebrew word for friend, you know, there's a verse that says, uh, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The Hebrew word for friend is related to the word secret. Think about that. There's a connection between the word friend and secret. So in other words, a level four friend is somebody who's invited in to the inner man. Someone that you trust, you know, somebody that uh, is not a spectator in your life, but a participant. It's so easy to have a tribe of companions, but it's not easy to have somebody who knows you down inside, all right? It says a man of many companions will come to ruin. That is, you know, we'll go our own way because there's no one there to call us back, all right? My worst season ever is because I isolated. I mentioned already that I was leading the church. You know, int integral to leading the church is getting up and preaching on Sunday morning. I got a place where I couldn't do, I couldn't prepare. I was frozen. Something was bad wrong with me, but I wouldn't tell anybody. My wife knew something was wrong with me. She's like, you need help. You need medication. And I'm like, well, I think medication would be like cheating. And she said, you are not currently winning <laughs> you know 
I just isolated. I was so prideful, unwilling to tell anybody what was really going on. And it was a downward spiral in a really difficult season. Okay? I, I do now have people that I go to, right? Uh, uh, level four friends, right? Uh, you know, outside your spouse. Yeah, somebody asked that question in the, in the last session in here too. But my wife is a level four friend. And this fellow who asked me the question, his wife is a level four friend. But when she's the only level four friend, then all she does is get crushed under the burden of what I'm bearing with no place to go. And all she wants to do is help and she's powerless and that sends her into a tailspin, right? So I think this is so good. But here's the deal with level four friends. Someone's got to go there. Someone's got to step across the line of vulnerability. Someone's got to go there. Now our fear is, as soon as we tell somebody what's really going on inside, we fear rejection. And almost never is that what happens, right? Usually, you know, there's a sense of identification or appreciation. Thank you for trusting me enough to tell you that. You know, C.S. Lewis has this famous quote that says, friendship begins when you say, wait, you two? I thought I was the only one, right? Yeah, we we're part of a group this last year where, where uh, some guy told something to our group that, that I don't think he'd ever spoken public before. He was torqued up before he said it, that he'd been incarcerated. He was torqued up before he said it. He thought when I put this out there, they're going to say, I'm unlike the rest of this group. Psh, just the opposite. Embraced. Right? So uh, we've got to have a level four friend. That, that's it. Uh, number three, uh, don't buy the lie. It, it, we, it, you know, there's this concept in the New Testament. It's called taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ taking our thoughts captive. Okay, so I had this conversation with an older guy, not really a mentor, but he was a good friend, an older guy. He asked me one day, like, uh, how you doing? I said, you know what? I feel like I'm the worst dad in the world. And he said, mm, that's not a feeling, that's a thought. I said, okay, semantics. I think I'm the worst dad. No, no, he said, it's not semantics. It's an important difference. See, we feel subject to our feelings, like we can't control what we feel. But if it's a thought, we can evaluate whether it's true or not. So now rephrase what you just said. I said, okay. He said, a feeling can be described in one word, one adjective. So re-say it. I said, okay. I feel anxious because I think I'm the worst dad in the world. He said, okay, great, perfect. Now let's evaluate what you think. You think you're the worst dad in the world. Now, is that true or is that a lie? I'm like, well, I'm guessing there's at least one dad out there who's worse than me, all right? So it's not true, okay? The other thing is, if I buy that lie, what does it do? All it does is paralyzes me. The fact is, I'm not done being a dad yet. And if I buy the lie that I'm the worst dad in the world, all it does is takes me out of the game for the rest of the run, right? Don't buy the lie. We gotta, we gotta break down. What are you feeling in one word and what's the thought behind it and is it true? Usually it's not. Okay, here's the last thing and then we're out of here. Uh, my last thing for, for, for strategy for the long haul is to live from your new heart. If, you, if you're here, you're a follower of Jesus. All right, the moment you came to faith in Christ, you didn't just ascribe to a doctrine, you didn't just join an organization, you didn't just commit to follow certain rules. When you came to faith in Christ, a new life was really born in you. So when we talk about who you are on the inside, there is a real, true, living reality of the life of Jesus Christ living inside of you, All right? The way it puts it in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 is this. We have this treasure that is the life of Christ in these jars of clay that is my frail and fallen human life. We have this treasure in these chars of clay that the surpassing greatness of the power will be seen to be of God and not of man. That's my new heart. Here's my picture of it. So uh, some years ago in Fort Worth, they had a snowstorm. And snowstorms in Fort Worth are like snowstorms in Houston. You know, it's a total blizzard, like two inches. And uh, 
and it shuts the whole city down. So everybody goes out to do whatever they can do in the snow. I'll make a snowball, I'll make a snowman, I'll find a cardboard box and slide down a hill. All right, so this teenage, this teenage son of uh, my sister's friend and his buddies decided they're gonna have fun of a different kind. So they got in his four wheel drive Bronco, and this is back when Broncos were big and square, and you know, you know it, was a, it was a machine. And they went driving through the neighborhood looking for unsuspecting snowmen that they could just run down. All right, so they'd pop up over the curve and drive through the yard, and boom, they just send Frosty flying. Okay, then one after another, they're having a great time. Until they met this snowman that said, not in my house. And that snowman reached up and pulled the transmission out of that Bronco because that snowman was built around a fire hydrant, right? Okay, if you're Father Christ, that's your reality. You feel like a snowman, but there's a fire hydrant inside of you to depend on, to call on, to ask for strength so that in your weakness, his strength will be made perfect so that you can be the dad that you're designed to be. Remember that, you know, as goes the heart, So goes the man, as goes the father, so goes the family, okay? All right, I think that's our time. So uh, I'm around if I can answer any questions, but you probably need to wrap it up, okay?